put together what I read a moment ago. That, by the way, is the second paragraph of the United States Constitution. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain and unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I want you to consider for a moment the logical uh, progression of thought. It says that we were created. The fact that you and I were created implies a creator. The creator implies absolute authority. In other words, if you and I were created by God, God is greater than us and has absolute authority and autonomy over us. Because we were created and because of the creator and his absolute authority, there is an inherent equity in us created by God. Remember, there used to be this little thing with a child, with a little kid. He was sitting there with his arms like this, and he said, God don't make no junk. <laughs> and that's the inherent part of our equality. We are not all created with the same abilities. We are not created with the same measure of strength. We are not created exactly the same in all of our ways. But the fact that God made you means that you were created in God's image, and in there we have equity. An equality that cannot be done away with without understanding that you violated the sovereignty of God. And in that, there is freedom. Our freedom is connected to our Creator. This passage says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And the framers of our Constitution had an understanding of the inherent necessity of the Creator as a logical reason to, to expect freedom. Our freedom, like truth, comes from God. Truth is immutable. That means it doesn't change, just like God doesn't change. There are those in our day who say, well, truth is a relative thing, and your truth may not be my truth. You know what? If your truth and my truth aren't the same, one of us is not telling the truth. But when God tells the truth, it's truth and it's eternal. And it will always be there. It doesn't change. God doesn't shift back and forth. In other words, God isn't going to say, well, I loved you yesterday, but today I don't love you anymore. God does not change like that. Our freedom like truth comes from God. Truth is immutable and it proceeds from God and so does your freedom. I want you to look, if you will, at uh, Psalm chapter 2. And I'm going to share this with you as a bit of a, um, as a look at what God sees and why freedom is so elusive. Why is it that of all the nations of the world, there aren't that many nations where they, they really have freedom? I mean, even in the European nations, there are many more rules and regulations even in Canada, you know, you can be jailed up there for things that you can do here and get away with. Our freedom is a gift of God. From God's perspective, God sees things this way. This is God's, God is opening up a little window for you to look through to see what he sees when he looks at, at the world. And, and uh, Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. It says, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and, take, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now that means God and the anointed is a reference to the Messiah who is Christ. And it's by saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Now, here is something that God is helping us understand. There are many in this world 
who believe that the source of restriction of life is God himself. And what God is telling us is that's not true. But let me keep reading. So they say, let's break their bonds and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven, God, shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Now, I want you to understand, this doesn't mean that God takes joy or, in, or entertainment value out of what happens to this mentality. It's actually that God looks at us when we shake our fist at God, and there's an amusement about that. Uh, many years ago, when I was uh, in my um, late teens, early 20s, my niece was just a tiny little thing, and I used to agitate her beyond measure. That's what uncles do. And she would get mad, and she would come up and grab a hold of me, and with her little bitty hand, grab my kneecap and squeeze until she trembled. And, and my reaction was, I just burst out laughing. And it wasn't I was enjoying her anger. It was the attempt at expressing that anger against me. It was just hilarious. And so when God sees this attitude from human beings, it's amusing because it's so ridiculous. Now, let me read all the way further. He says, he shall speak to them, verse 5, in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill, and I will declare the decree the Lord said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Now, this speaks of redemption. But it speaks primarily of the exaltation of the Son of God. And then he says, ask of me, oh, I'm sorry, verse 9, you shall break them with a rod of iron and shall dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. A lot of folks find that verse to be very confusing. Rejoice with trembling. But it's an attitude of praise. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. His wrath was kindled, but a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. Let's ask God to bless the word as we go on. Father, I do pray your blessing upon the word. God, that we may rightly understand it and apply it. But God, also that we may reap the joy that awaits us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. In Isaiah 66, Isaiah says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, and freedom to prisoners. Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 4 he takes that prophecy and he says that's why I came you see this prophecy some 650 years before Jesus was born Jesus steps onto the playing field of life and says I am here to do just what God promised he would do in Romans 8.21, it says that the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. I want to talk just a little bit about spiritual freedom in general. In Genesis chapter 3, we have the story of the fall. We have the story where Satan, in the form of the serpent, comes to the two created beings and says to them, has God actually said? He brings deceit into the world with temptation, and he tells Adam and Eve, God is actually afraid that you are going to become like him. And so with deceit, he tempts them, and they sin. Sin came into the world, and our freedom went away with that temptation and with that sin. 
our freedom to be what we were created to be. In other words, God made us for his own glory in order that we may have blessed fellowship with him. And that was just messed up. And ever since that time, Satan's work has been to deceive the world. Now, you know, the Bible calls him the prince of this world and, and the prince of the air. And essentially, what the Bible tells us is that his work is to confound. There is a hideous blanket of spiritual delusion designed by Satan. And it confounds the wisdom of this world. Now, again, the Bible uses the term world in this context, not as a description of this, uh, you know, as they say, third rock from the sun. It is not a description of, of the planet we live on. It is a description of the spiritual nature of fallen man. So when the Bible talks about the world has turned away from God, it means that spiritually the creation and all of God's creation has been distorted because of this illusion and the deception that Satan has laid across us. It is designed to draw us deeper into the web of bondage of sin and Satan. Mm -hmm. I'm going to illustrate this a little bit. A person who is an addict is usually very aware that they're an addict. When we talk about a person being in denial, they're not denying they are using the drug. They're denying it's a bad thing. They're denying it's a problem. Why do they do that? They do that for the same reason that you and I deny we're wrong when we're wrong. A person who becomes an addict, their world is messed up. Other people see what's going on in their life, they intervene. But the addict, rather than accepting and acknowledging the truth, they are tempted and lured to descend into a, a, a spiral of deeper isolation and pain. That doesn't make sense, does it? You would think that if someone would come along and say, look, I'm here, we're going to walk through this together. You would think that would be all it would take. But unfortunately, the nature of man doesn't work that way all the time. It seldom works that way. Those folks who deal with people that have been abused will tell you that often an abused child actually grows up to become an abusive parent. Why is that? Why wouldn't the abused child say, I will never do that? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever said to yourself, I will never do that, only to find at a later date that's exactly what you did? This spiritual deceit that Satan has put over us it's kind of like a compass that's set to the wrong coordinates. You know, I don't know if you've ever been out in the woods or anything, or if you've ever used the GPS. Uh, GPS is a great thing, but sometimes it just, it's weird. We were over in West Virginia one time, and the GPS was telling us to go across what really looked like a, a wagon path. I could see the Applebee's. But this GPS has me up a cul-de-sac telling me to go across a path that I don't think I could have ridden a horse across, let alone driven a car. But you know how foolish it is it to have a compass, and the compass says, that's north, and you think, well, I don't know, I think I'm going to go off this way. It doesn't make sense. And especially when the Word of God becomes a spiritual lamppost for us that says, you are in a place where there is a natural delusion and a deception that is inherent in the problem of this world and sin. And God gives us his word as the compass that says, if you will walk this way, I will get you out of the darkness and into the light. But our nature is rebellious. There in, in Psalm chapter 2, Rather than acknowledging that the bonds that we are under of, of oppression are because of our own sin, there is a temptation in us to blame God. Have you or someone you know ever 
got themselves in a situation and it got worse and worse and eventually they got angry at God and they said, God, how did you do this to me? I, I know of a person who was a dear friend of mine who through a series of poor judgments and mistakes became so discouraged that he turned on God. He was a pastor. And he, he apostated. And it broke my heart because I can see the pattern that he took. But his anger was so intense and, and so misguided at God that he would not even talk about God. It breaks my heart. But there is the nature of the deception. And so God doesn't want us to be in that deception. He sent Christ that we may have freedom. In other words, God has stood squarely in the middle of the highway of destruction and jammed a sign down that says, Stop and turn around and follow me because you're going the wrong way. You know, uh, the old joke was, the pilot comes on and says, I've got good news and bad news. The bad news is we're going the wrong way. The good news is we're making great time. <laughs> there are an awful lot of folks making great time but going in the wrong direction, spiritually speaking. It is a spiritual reality that without God's grace, I am not going to understand truth, and I'm not going to get it right. I'm not going to fix what's wrong. In the world that we live in, there is a mentality that by the triumph of the human spirit, we're going to overcome our problems. And even the wise of this world, as the Bible says of them, they are, de they are deluded and they can't see that they're going the wrong direction. And they won't see it until God intervenes in their life. And if God has intervened in your life, the truth that says turn around, it's because of grace, not your intellect, not your character. It's grace upon grace. Nationally, the freedom that we have experienced in this country has been remarkable. There are problems, as there always have been, and I'm sure always will be on this earth, with this nation. And there are those who I believe in their deception, whether they are deceived and in turn they are proclaiming deceit, that certain things in our nation need to be changed spiritually. Freedom is interwoven with being reconciled to God. Our nation, even though, well, I'm going to put it this way. From Plymouth Rock and Jamestown and through Philadelphia in the Continental Congress of 1776, our nation had men who believed that freedom is the byproduct of righteousness and God's blessing. There are those who deny that. I got into a conversation, well, a bit of a debate. A friend of mine put some on Facebook, and I added a little comment, and somebody that I did not know came back with this blistering uh, commentary about what I had to say about God and our nation. And I just put down, I didn't know what it was, I said, uh, I said, you're, you're misinformed. Actually, I put some about that our nation was founded you know, for God's glory, and they put back this blistering comment that, no, it wasn't. And I, and I just typed out, you're misinformed. And the reply came back, well, I don't know how I got through law school without your wisdom. <laughs> and along with that, this person had put a little, um, uh, a, a web, or a place, uh, I'm not trying to have you click on a, another site. And it was someone who was saying our nation didn't have Christian leaders as our founding fathers. And oddly enough, I read this, I figured I'll read what they've got to say, and I read it, and in that argument against our nation having Christian leaders, four of our Christian leaders were referred to and their specific faith. And I, and I just answered back, and 
really I was trying to get away, Miss. I don't want to get into one of those goofy Facebook arguments, you know. I just put back, I read the article with some interest, some of it I agreed with, but if I were trying to say America did not have a Christian foundation, I wouldn't use an article that four times says they did. Law school aside, I didn't go to law school, but I kind of figured that out. There are folks who adamantly disagree that our nation had a Christian foundation. The truth of the matter is, our nation was blessed by people who were people of prayer. Now, for God's own purpose, and not because I think America is more righteous than other nations inherently, but for God's own purpose, God has blessed this nation to free. Our nation was established by people who believe that if I put God first, if I love God with all my heart, if I love my neighbor as myself, we did not need a strong government lording it over me because my faith in God and the fear of the Lord would cause me to treat you the way I would like to be treated. Now, our nation has at times had glaring failures in the way we've applied that. The freedom we now enjoy is a direct result of decisions of those from Plymouth Rock, Jamestown, Philadelphia. That those who apply Christian principles to be self-governed, it must be acknowledged that in our humanity, we have too often failed to apply freedom and justice equally. But it also should be noted that the corrections that have been made so far have come in great measure within the church and the Christian community and on Christian principles. The abolitionist movement, the civil rights movement, and the right to life movement have been principally the result of Christian input into what's going on in our culture and society. Our nation is blessed, but we are pushing the bounds of lifting our fists toward God and rejecting him. Personally, freedom is interwoven with being reconciled to God. I mentioned that a moment ago. I need to be reconciled to God before I can be reconciled to myself. Because no matter what deception Satan may use, there is an inner testimony that says, I'm not right until God makes me right. And until I am reconciled with God and then reconciled to myself, it is only then that I have the true freedom to be reconciled to others. Because God wants me to be reconciled to sinners in the same way that he, the Son of God, was reconciled to a sinner like me. He was reconciled to me in himself before I was saved. Having saved me and reconciled me to himself spiritually, now he wants me to be reconciled even to those who will not be reconciled to me. And I'm going to tell you something, that doesn't come easy. <clears throat> I need revelation and truth. I need God to stand in the midst of all this obstruction and all of this delusion and say to me here is the truth I am the way follow me and don't listen to the deceiver when the deceiver says what I want to hear and the Lord says that's not true and it causes me to be reconciled to him and makes it possible for me to be reconciled to others there are many ways spiritual bondage is manifested in mankind. Galatians 5 and 1 Peter 2 refer to the freedom that we have as believers in Christ. And that freedom is so great. I need revelation to see truth. I need God's power and grace that once I see what the truth is that I may actually live it out. Because unlike this idea of trying to be human spirit, I am spiritually dead until Christ lightens me with his grace. And I also need God's word 
for strength and guidance. You see, I need to be reconciled to God. I need his word to set the path for successful living and joy and peace. And then I need his word for strength and guidance. As his world reveals truth to me and empowers me to do the truth. There are many ways spiritual bondage is manifested in me. And even though I've been given the freedom of Christ, my freedom is such in Christ that I actually, though I've been liberated from the bondage of sin and Satan, I have such a measure of freedom that the Bible warns me. The Apostle Paul says, be careful that you don't exercise your freedom in ways that take you back to the bondage. Have you ever had something in your life that had power over you? Uh, maybe, maybe you were a smoker, and maybe God took that away and delivered you from it. But you know, I, I've talked with some folks who, who will have given great testimony. You know what? God took that away from me. But it was some time in their life, something came along and for whatever reason, they went back to it. I've had some folks tell me, you know what? The first time I quit smoking, God took it away just like that. But the next time, he made me work for it. You ever heard anybody talk like that? Has there ever been anything in your life that God has delivered you from that you made a conscious decision to return to and God didn't make it quite so easy that second time? You see, that's called presuming on God's grace. It doesn't mean that God has cast you away. It means that God didn't owe to you the first time of freedom. And he certainly didn't owe you a second chance. And the reason he made it harder that second time wasn't because he was just ticked off at you. It's because you, at that point, needed to learn how precious that grace was. God has given me salvation. He set me free from the bonds of sin. But there are all kinds of things that really want to get back into my life. There's all the things that God has set me free from and said those no longer have dominion over you. Things like the use of the tongue. How hard is it to corral this little piece of flesh that flaps between your lips? I often say God was kind enough to tie one end of it down. He says to me, now you do something with the other end. Sometimes I don't do a good job. And when I allow my tongue to get the best of me and I don't bring it under submission, guess what? I experience the bondage of sin. Lust, greed, covetousness, they're all there. And the fact that I've been saved by God's grace doesn't mean that I don't have the capability of exercising those things. But I'm supposed to have the common sense and the grace of God that says, that's deadly. And God stands between me and those things and says, don't return to that for which I've given you victory and freedom. It says, for if after they had escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and uh, Savior Christ Jesus, they again entertain them and are overcome. And the last state has become worse for them than the first. And in 1 Peter 2, it says, act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. My freedom is decreed. It's an absolute certainty as much as my eternal life itself. Yet like many of my uh, eternal treasures, <laughs> its decree is being revealed in me and is as of yet an imperfect reality. That's why I struggle. That's why we all struggle. Anger, forgiveness, addictive behavior, gluttony, the use of the tongue, and the list goes on. And the truth of the matter is, the bonds on my life are not the bonds of God's law. You know what God's law does? God's law illustrates to me the holiness of God, what God's character looks like. And the truth of the matter is, when I finally grow up and realize 
that in the law of God, that's where my liberty actually is. The restraints that God has put on me are not to keep me from joy. They are to restrain me from evil and its consequences. And as Paul said, now I walk at liberty within the law. You know, there's a tendency for lawlessness in every one of us. Should I ask here if anybody's broken the speed limit lately? I will not ask that question because you're allowed to want to know how I've done. But I understand this. The law of God is the guardrails of my liberty. My liberty as a human being, as a child of God, is designed for me to have the greatest measure of freedom I can have on this earth, and it is designed for me to have the ultimate freedom when I stand before God, clothed in glory. And I may not get it perfectly right here, but the wise person embraces the law of liberty, embraces the person and work of Christ, lives in that grace, follows the word of God instead of always testing the limit. As parents, how many times have we drawn our children back away from the freedom to make choices when they demonstrated an inability to make wise choices? How much greater the love of God that says to us, you have no idea how dangerous that is. This passage says, it used to say, <laughs> it says, where uh, the Spirit is, there is freedom. Freedom is in Christ, as a nation, as individuals. So sit the Lord in truth. Father, I give you praise for the freedom that we have. I pray for our nation. I pray for us as individuals that we may be godly people who can be trusted. And I pray, Lord, that our nation would once again embrace the source of peace and freedom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our closing this morning is number 175. Though your sins be a scarlet. 175. Let's stand together.